cold November's evening in 1987, a deadly fire erupted at London's King's Cross tube station. A blazing inferno would eventually engulf the underground passageways and destroy the entire booking hall. But few would have predicted that when the first little flames peeped out of the stairs on the Piccadilly line escalator. Transport policeman Stephen Hansen was one of the first to go down and try to put the fire out. The more I stamped it, the more I tried to put it out, the worse the, the, worse the flame got. And um, I knew straight away that it wasn't a normal um, fire at all. There was a lot of smoke, it was quite hot. But I, at the back of my mind, I, I thought, well, the fire brigade are going to arrive in a minute and, then, and everything's going to be sorted out. With that comforting thought in mind, Stephen Hansen went back up the stationary escalator to stop the evening's commuters coming down. He would be in the booking hall for just a few short minutes when he was engulfed by flames. The only way I can describe this is call it a living thing because it was, it was so massive in its entirety that within a few seconds it had covered the whole ticket office enclosure. I knew that I was in a dangerous situation myself and that if I stayed much longer I wasn't going to be able to breathe. I arrived at the, uh, the barrier system, which was metal at the time. The heat was that bad that my hand, when I touched the barrier to leap over, actually stuck to the metal. I had to pull it off, which really took a large um, piece of skin out of my hand. And the skin had melted and it was, the hands were type of bubbling. And as soon as I heard the, the screams, um, the fight for life, the undescribable noises coming from the, the actual ticket office in the enclosure. Because he knew the layout of the underground station, Stephen managed to escape. Third degree burns covered his head, hands and face, but he was one of the lucky ones. 31 people, including a senior firefighter, lost their lives that night. The task of working out the cause of London's worst tube fire fell to David Halliday. Once underground, he started to examine the Piccadilly line escalator. Looking up from the bottom of the escalator, I could see that the lowest point of damage, approximately a third of the way up, uh, was more concentrated on the right-hand side. So turning to the right-hand side, I found that a certain amount of the steelwork in that area had distorted. Now, this was unusual. It, wasn't the case further up the escalator where it looked like there was a greater degree of heat damage but right low down at this point of origin as I decided it was that was where the steelwork was distorted and where the fire had been burning very hot. Next Dave Halliday squeezed down a steep and narrow stairway to examine the area underneath the escalator. The only burnable materials that were present were a very thick layer of grease which had built up between the wheels on the trackway. It appeared to have been squeezed there by the natural action of the wheels over a period of time and the grease itself was very dirty. It had a great deal of fluff impregnated in it. But I also found one other thing which was when I looked at the skirting board directly above the grease on the trackway there were a number of spots along it where there were small charred areas. These charred areas weren't very severe They'd only led to the delamination of some of the plywood, indicating to me that there must have been, at some time, other small fires burning on that self-same escalator. So how could all these small escalator fires have started? At the time of the King's Cross fire, you couldn't smoke on the tube, but you could light up once you came up the escalators. It's very easy to strike a match, light your cigarette, and then, in your own eyes, safely dispose of the match by throwing it forwards and downwards, away from the passenger standing above you on the escalator stair. But was that really how it happened? The only way to find out was for Dave Halliday to test it. First, he tried to light a sample of pure grease. The match doesn't actually do a great deal to the grease, apart from actually melt it. In fact, even if I apply quite a vigorous flame from a Bunsen burner, I still can't get the grease to light. It's a very different story, though. If you use the grease which is impregnated with the dust and fluff, that makes all the difference. The dust and fluff mixed in with the grease acts as a wick, and that's why 
the grease burnt under King's Cross escalator. The story now moves on to the remote Derbyshire peaks and a bizarre underground tunnel. It's the place where a little band of fire investigators carry out their subterranean experiments. Their job would be to work out why this killer fire had spread so fast. We rebuilt part of the escalator in the, in the tunnel that, that we're in at present. And we rebuilt about five to six steps of that escalator um, to full size. In fact, using wood taken from unburned sections of the other escalators. When the fire had spread onto the uh, visible side of the escalator, it spread slowly across the treads and risers of the escalator. And it also um, radiated heat onto the other side of the escalator. And eventually, that the flames from one side um, reached across to the other and ignited the other side. And at that point, the whole of the escalator became involved. At this stage, we'd established that how the fire could spread across the escalator. But what we hadn't established was how that fire would then spread up the escalator, a matter of some 20 metres, in a time which was probably, by most accounts, less than a minute. But answering that question had Keith Moody's people stumped. It was time for something new. Enter two computer scientists whose speciality is how things flow. The HSC are a little bit uh, uncertain about the effect of the aerodynamics of the very complex tunnel arrangements and passages and the booking hall. They asked us to use a relatively new technique that we'd been using at that stage called computational fluid dynamics. And they thought that this new technique could open up some new insight into what had happened. The HSC gave me plans of the tunnel and the booking hall and actually more complex tunnels all around the system as well but we decided we only needed to model that particular escalator tunnel in the booking hall itself. And I then had to transfer those dimensions of the geometry into the system so that the computer would know what the geometry looked like. So Suzanne made up this spider's web-like simulation of the King's Cross booking hall and the three Piccadilly line escalators going down into the escalator tunnel. What we had to do was to set up little bricks uh, like Lego bricks connected all together. In each of these bricks we would be solving the fundamental equations of fluid flow. We would, they would all be connected together and then we'd have to solve the equations in these tens of thousands of cells for many, many time steps to watch the development of the fire. Once they'd built the skeleton of King's Cross, Suzanne ran the calculations. So complex was the mathematics, it took the computer six months before it gave results. And when it did, the two scientists were stunned. The results were showing that the hot temperatures were near the floor of the escalator. And everybody knows that hot air rises. That was quite a surprise. Um, in fact, we were quite worried we'd got gravity turned upside down, for example, which is quite possible to do on the computer. So we went and checked that found we had got gravity up the right way, but found that the escalator trent was actually the hottest part. You normally wouldn't expect to see a fire lying low down, but what we were telling them was to look down, look at the effect of the fire and the wood that was all there, and from then on, that would explain the very rapid, the, the reasons for the very rapid spread of the fire. Could flames really spread downwards rather than up? Could hot air really fail to rise? Was this really why 31 people died? Keith Moody prepared for the ultimate test. What we made here was a third scale replica. The booking hall was up on the top here and the escalator system ran down here to an entrance area at the bottom. <laughs> Once they'd spent all their effort on building it, they stepped back and set it on fire. Was the most unlikely of predictions to become a reality. As the fire took hold, the flames were standing up, but after a few seconds, the flames actually lay down in the trench and started to travel up the trench. Someone who was standing at the top at the time said, it's just like Harwell said it would happen, which was nice to hear standing at the bottom. And the effect of that was that both the radiant heat and the convective heat from the fire were available to preheat the wood in front of the flame front. So that wood would more readily ignite. And as a consequence, that flame would travel at a faster and faster rate of the escalator. I 
and anybody at the top would have been suddenly overtaken by a jet of flame emerging very rapidly into the booking hall. It really gave people new insight into the behavior of the fire. It had shown them that the fire could spread in a way that was totally unexpected. And that effect became known as the trench effect, the new phenomena in fire dynamics. So flames in a trench will stay low down, hugging the floor as they advance. On-site investigation, practical testing, physical reconstruction, computer simulation, all the available tools of the investigator's trade were used to piece together the puzzle of King's Cross. Following this remarkable discovery, undergrounds around the world were made safer for us all. The fire investigator's trade is rooted in experience, but it's always on the move. The world of virtual reality and portable computers has arrived. It could change the craft forever. This is something totally new. This brings the fire scene to the investigator. This allows an investigator to come into a room, look 360 degrees around, just like it's with his or her own eyes. Again, it immerses you right inside the scene. I can scan the entire living room, just like I was standing there. I can look up. I can look down. I can change rooms. I can walk into another room and assess the damage in that room. It's only the beginning of what can be done with this type of technology. But whatever the future may bring, the qualities a fire investigator needs will always remain the same. Thorough, patient, curious, inquisitive, and they can't take no for an answer. And details of next week's programme are coming up in just a moment. And the book of the series...